Hello, and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Neil McFarland, and today we have with us Ambassador R. Richard Rubottom. Ambassador Rubottom was certified a number of years ago as a distinguished alumnus of SMU. And after a, his distinguished career in the United States uh, Foreign Service, he came back to the campus and served as a vice president in the administration of President Willis Tate. Dick, it's a pleasure to meet you here. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Our relationship is now something over 30 years. Yes. It began back in the mid-60s when both of us uh, served in the administration of the university. But your relationship to SMU goes far, far further back than that. And I'd like to ask you to recall some of the circumstances that brought you to SMU and how old were you at that particular time? <laughs> <coughs> well, as I look back on those years and many years since, all I can say is it was a, a whole series of life transforming experiences. Some people might call it divine intervention. Some people might call it uh, luck. Uh, some might say, and I would agree at least uh, remembering how I worked in Brownwood before I came here, that hard work had something to do with it. But uh, I graduated from Brownwood High School when I was uh, 16. Uh, there were four boys who were invited into the principal's office a few days before graduation. I remember their names quite well. We were sent to the uh, blackboard with our grade sheets for the four years. And I, uh, had the uh, best grades of the four boys by two-tenths of a point <laughs> and was able to uh, get the scholarships that were offered by universities in those days. But believe it or not, SMU did not offer a scholarship to the second ranking person, only the first ranking person who was the girl in my class. And uh, about uh, halfway through the summer, I had a phone call saying that she had decided to go somewhere else and that SMU would offer me that scholarship, which I accepted. And I came up here and uh, uh, met uh, a man named uh, Daniels, who had charge of student employment. And then I went over and talked to the registrar and uh, with that scholarship and $50 that my mother had borrowed at the bank to give me a little cash in hand, I came up here and started. Daniels had promised me a job. Uh, after the first week, uh, I went in and I said, I'm still waiting for that job. He said, well, I don't have anything. Why don't you go out for football? <laughs> and I said, uh, Mr. Daniels, I've never had on a football uniform in my life, let alone played football. He said, well, go try it for a week. So at the end of a week, I came back and I said, I'm on the bottom of every stack. <laughs> and I said, I, you're not going to have a student here very long if you don't get me some kind of a job. And eventually, I got a job working at the Haskell Theater mm -hmm. over in East Dallas. And a wonderful man named Paul P. Scott picked me up every night at 6 o'clock at Atkins Hall to take me over to the Haskell Theater where I worked seven days a week. I sold popcorn, took up tickets, uh, changed the marquee signs, and closed the theater because he always left at 9 o'clock. And then I came home on the streetcar down Elm Street and across McKinney to McKinney and up McKinney to SMU. That was the Green Dragon, the old that Green was the Dragon. Green Dragon. Right, yes. I got in by special <laughs> permission after the doors were locked at the dormitory. I and I had a wonderful experience at SMU. I, uh, uh, I had, uh, had to work awfully hard. Uh, I think uh, students might be interested in the fact that I thought I could write, for example. Mm -hmm. I had been editor of the uh, high school newspaper. And I uh, took Engl freshman English from a wonderful, uh, very mature teacher, I think the widow of a Methodist preacher who happened to be the matron of Virginia Hall, the girls' oh, dormitory. Yeah. 
I turned in my first theme, and it came back with a resounding F, uh, the lowest grade you could make. And it, boy, was I uh, dis, dis, uh, disillusioned. But she uh, tinkered along and uh, encouraged me and gradually uh, got to the point where I uh, earned an A in that course. And I've always felt that uh, in my foreign service days that uh, the basic writing skills, nothing fancy that would uh, qualify me for the literary uh, mm -hmm. chair, but the basic writing skills I learned really at SMU, yeah. perhaps a little bit in high school, but SMU mm -hmm. did that for me. Now you and came here at age 16, which age is 16. unusually young. Did you come with uh, a major in mind or a career plan in mind? No, uh, as a matter of fact, I declared a major in journalism uh, because I had been a high school journalist uh, and uh, it seemed to be a logical thing to do. Although in those days, journalism was notorious for low pay, mm -hmm. but I, that wasn't my principal goal at the time. But fortunately, uh, I took uh, 18 hours of history and 18 hours of government, now called political science, as well as 18 hours in journalism. So I had really a triple major. I see. And uh, there were two wonderful persons that had great influence on me uh, at that time. Uh, I should mention a couple of my teachers also, H.H. Uh, H. Geis and S.D. Myers in the government department. But uh, when I was uh, about to graduate my senior year, well, Dean Schuler. Uh, came over one day across the campus and just happened to stop me and said, Dick, what are you going to do next year? And I said, well, I'm going to be editor of the school paper. He said, I know that, but you're graduating in about two weeks. What are you going to do besides edit the paper? I said, well, I'll take some courses. He said, come in to see me the next day, which I did. And he offered me the Arnold Fellowship in government. Mm. And uh, one of my classmates also got an Arnold Fellowship in government. So we both studied for our uh, master's degree. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, each one of us took four classes. And two of those classes, we were the only two people in the class. Uh, we met with Myers for uh, international law, and we met with Geist for constitutional law. And uh, they agreed in advance, the professors did, that rather than us brief every single case in these big thick case books, that we could make a copy of our brief and share it with the other person so that we only had to brief every other case. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting that uh, master's degree at the age of 21 in those days was an extraordinarily uh, good stroke of luck because uh, up until the end of World War II, I got doors open to me for various uh, interviews, even job opportunities, and mm -hmm. so on, uh, as a result of having an MA uh, that I probably would not have otherwise. Yeah. So you left here with two SMU degrees. Exactly. Uh, yes. I seem to recall that uh, you were a contemporary of our former esteemed president, uh, Willis Tate. Uh, he was uh, also, of course, a stalwart in the defensive line of the, or in the line of the <laughs> SMU football team. You were not a football player by your own admission, but you did play tennis, didn't you? I did play tennis. In yeah. fact, I made a freshman letter in tennis. Good. But, uh, and Houston Wasson, <coughs> who was captain of that team, the freshman team, and later captain of the varsity, went on to be, I think, SMU's second Rhodes Scholar. Hmm. But a wonderful, wonderful fellow yeah. who later practiced law in New York, uh, now deceased. But yes, Willis Tate, uh, I met at the Lambda Chi Alpha Fraternity House uh, in the second semester of my freshman year. Uh, I had uh, been invited to some houses early, uh, but I didn't know what a fraternity was. I uh, didn't have the slightest idea of uh, the uh, Greek world at that time. And so, and I couldn't afford it, so I had to say no to all the offers that were made uh, to pledge a fraternity and when, when I got here in September. But by February, uh, I had uh, been around the campus long enough, knew enough people, that I decided that I would make whatever sacrifice was necessary or give up something else in order to uh, join a fraternity. 
and uh, Willis Tate and uh, Logan Ford, now deceased, a prominent Dallas lawyer, uh, took a great deal of interest in me at the Lambda Chi House, and I decided to join that fraternity. Uh, and I was uh, initiated, I think, the next fall. And that turned out to be a, a very, very important uh, opportunity because at the end of my fifth year here, I was just about to receive my master's degree, I was offered uh, the job of traveling secretary for the fraternity. Uh, of which there were two. And so for two years after accepting that job, I traveled all over the United States, one year in the East and one year in the West. Uh, it gave me a great opportunity to not only see the country, but to be trained to get up on my feet and mm -hmm. speak to people on short notice, get acquainted, remember names, uh, be at ease with uh, university deans and presidents and things of that kind. So that, again, was sort of a transforming yeah, experience. Said, for a boy from Brownwood, Texas, that was an auspicious <laughs> opportunity, wasn't it? Sure it sure was. And it led on to some, uh, some obvious results, I suppose. Uh, tell us a little bit about your subsequent career. Well, uh, there was another man who was equally influential to Dean Zumbrunnen, Dean V.I. Moore. Dean of Student Life at the University of Texas, I had called on when I was working for the fraternity. And I told Dean Moore that as a result of that experience I was having and meeting people like him, that I thought that was a career I would like to follow. And I'd enjoy being considered to be on his staff. Uh, he said, I have no money for another assistant, but he said, I'll bear you in mind when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, two years later, uh, I was just uh, rocking around, uh, sort of in the valley of my life, so to speak, working in the East Texas oil field, trying to make enough money to send my mother something every month. And I had a phone call one afternoon uh, in 1937, I guess July or August, from Dean V.I. Moore. He said, is this uh, the Rue Bottom whom I used to know uh, about three years ago, two years ago? And I said, uh, yes, sir. There aren't very many of us around, and I'm, I'm the one. He said, well, I got your location from Zumbrunning. Oh. He said, that's the only way I was able to track you yeah. down. He said, you remember that job I said I'd let you know about? He said, I want to make you the offer of that job and pay you $1,500 a year for nine months' work if you can be here on September the 8th. I said, I'll take it. That wasn't bad at that uh, time. It wasn't bad at that time at all. <laughs> and it was, uh, so that in turn brought me to the University of Texas uh, as a very young assistant uh, dean. I uh, think I, at that time I was 25. And uh, there, I, after one semester, I started taking graduate courses in government with the idea of getting a PhD eventually. And I had some wonderful professors, uh, great Latin Americanists, who uh, were distinguished throughout the country, throughout the world for their scholarship in that field, and I had spoken Spanish or, or it tried to speak Spanish through high school and college, and that was my principal interest, Latin America. Mm -hmm. And so I, I took these courses, and uh, I got involved emotionally in the uh, days just before World War II, after it broke out in Europe in 1939, and I applied for and got a Naval Reserve Commission in the Office of Naval Intelligence. And uh, in August of 1941, I was called to active duty. And uh, as a result of that uh, call, I was put in charge of personnel down in New Orleans in the district office, intelligence office there. But I kept writing and bugging Washington, the ONI office, to go to Latin America to use my Spanish. And finally, uh, in uh, Early 1943, I was assigned to Manzanillo, Mexico as Naval Liaison Officer. After two years there, I was assigned as Naval Attaché down in Asuncion, Paraguay. Now, if you look at the map and ask me, ask me why they have a Naval Attaché in Paraguay, I'll be <laughs> glad to tell you sometime. But uh, that, too, was a great experience. And um, I became interested in the Foreign Service. Ambassador Willard Bolak, my boss, when I was attaché in Paraguay, 
encouraged me to think about the Foreign Service career. Well, lo and behold, uh, in 1946, I believe it was, that Congress passed something called the War Manpower Act, which authorized them to recruit up to 250 officers who had, military officers who knew a language, had the college degrees, had lived abroad, and so on, which fit me to a T. Yeah. And I was in the first group of 10, after taking the oral exam, invited to join the Foreign Service. Yeah. That was so, in what year? No. Uh, that was, I actually uh, took my exam in 46 and joined the Foreign Service and went on duty in 47. 47. 47. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to Bogota, Colombia, my first post. Yes. Uh, that was a very, very exciting opportunity because uh, the uh, Ninth uh, International Conference of American States was scheduled to be held there in April of 48, mm -hmm. and I got there in July of 47, and the ambassador put me in charge of all the legwork. I was the gopher. He, of course, was working with the foreign minister uh, in preparation for that conference. Yeah. As a result, uh, when General Marshall, who headed the American delegation, and 62 other people came there on the American delegation for this conference, uh, I wound up being number 63 with the title of technical secretary, which is the way you uh, spell gopher in diplomatic <laughs> <Yeah>. language. <laughs> and uh, uh, things were going more or less uh, normally. I did get to know General Marshall slightly, and uh, his special assistant uh, was a good, became a good friend. And in, t in fact, he uh, turned to me and he said, uh, General Marshall would like to have dinner in the home of an American Foreign Service officer, not the, not the embassy resident. And I looked at him and I said, <laughs> are you suggesting something? Oh, yes. Uh, I said, well, I'll be glad to talk it over with Ms. Rubottom. So uh, we agreed that we would uh, have General Marshall on uh, the house for dinner on April the 9th, 1948. And I went to the ambassador and I got permission to invite the foreign minister uh, and a couple of other senior people whom I knew by that time in the Colombian government, and of course we invited the ambassador and his wife. We could seat 14 at our table, and the plans were uh, all set for that dinner. At 1.30 in the afternoon on April the 9th, the leading Liberal Party politician, Jorge Eliezer Gaetan, was assassinated on the street mm -hmm. of Bogota, and the town erupted into a pillaging, looting mob. Mm. And the downtown of Bogota was robbed blind, fires were set, both the newspapers right. were burned, and uh, it became literally a no man's land. Uh, and your dinner party and, was canceled. I I needless <laughs> to say, we didn't have the dinner party. Ambassador Bolak and I tried to get back to the residence. I had heard at lunch about the assassination. We tried to get there by car. We couldn't. We got out of the car. It happened that my residence was near the embassy residence. And we walked, and we saw a mob coming up the street. We turned and walked and went another way and couldn't get to the office. So we went to an apartment about a half a mile away where some of this large American delegation lived, and they had some offices there. And believe it or not, even though the mobs on the radio and so on were in, in, uh, trying to induce people to do even worse things, they never cut the telephone wires. Hmm. So the ambassador and I and others were able to use the telephone all that time, and uh, General Marshall was safe. Uh, he was in a home, uh, as were all the other foreign ministers, because they didn't have adequate hotels. And uh, he, he was in the home of a, of a wealthy Bogota fellow who happened to be in the beer business. Uh, that's incidental. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Bolak and I got over to the uh, ambassador's, uh, uh, foreign minister's residence, General Marshall's residence, to see that everything was all right. We sp spent the night in our respective homes, got up early the next morning and met General Marshall at 7 o'clock on April the 10th. And he was determined that this uh, mob scene in Bogota would not uh, cancel the conference. But some of the delegations were ready to cancel the conference. Mm -hmm. Well, I happen to know a Colombian senator 
Uh, and he was the only one you could reach because the president of Colombia was still under siege. People were trying to get him to resign. Yeah. Foreign minister was unavailable. So I went to this senator and I said, uh, General Marshall wants to hold a rump session this afternoon and persuade the delegations to continue and stay here and not let this conference be canceled. Well, of course, he was pleased to hear that. He was very, very happy. And he said, well, I hope it works. And sure enough, we met in the garage of the residence where the Honduran foreign minister was living. And, uh, and Marshall, in his august uh, uh, command presence, uh, stood up and said, we're not going to let a little thing like this run us out. We're going to continue this conference. That's, if we were to cancel it, that would be exactly what the communists would want. Of course, mm -hmm. this was the beginning of the Cold War days right. anyway, yes. 1948. So sure enough, they found a school out in uh, North Bogota where we could transfer the scene of the conference. And we moved out there. And Marshall stayed for another few days and then went on and left uh, Ambassador Norman Armour in charge of the American delegation. And um, I had my first experience in an international conference. Needless to say, it was a very telling one and a very maturing <laughs> one. I would think so. And I got to know some uh, significant people mm -hmm. in the process. Uh, in fact, uh, I've made a speech here in Dallas uh, to three or four settings uh, called Diplomat in No Man's Land, mm -hmm. describing my experiences on April the 9th and 10th in Bogota. But anyway, uh, after that, uh, I finished my tour there and was ordered to uh, Monterey, Mexico, uh, went to Washington. Ambassador, uh, later Ambassador Thomas Mann called me in his office. I'd never heard of him, but I knew his wife, who uh, was a, a girl I'd met in, when I was in Brownwood High School. She was in Waco High School. We'd gone to a conference together. He said, I understand you're supposed to go to Monterey. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I want to make you uh, Director of Mexican Affairs. Uh, would you accept the change? I said, well, I've lived in Manzanillo, Mexico, but I haven't lived in Mexico City. He said, yeah, I know something about your background. If you'll take the job, you can have it. So I took it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we wound up uh, living in, Dow in uh, Washington then for three and a half years. Uh, I became Director of Middle American Affairs. And I was able to negotiate two agreements with Mexico while I had that directorship. Uh, negotiations that had eluded other people. One was the Migrant Labor Agreement of 1951, and one was the Lend-Lease Settlement Agreement of 1952, I believe it was. And so then they called me in in early 52 and said, you've had this experience with Mexico. We want to pull you off of everything else you're doing and put you in charge of the Venezuelan Trade Agreement negotiation. I said, uh, I've never been in Caracas. I don't know anything about trade agreements. It's all right. You, you take the job. We'll, you can learn why you're going. So they put me up before the 15-man trade agreements committee, uh, which is uh, the boss of everything pertaining to trade. Very senior officers from five or six of the major departments all over Washington, state, commerce, labor, agriculture, and so on. And they put me through about a 30-minute uh, grilling and finally said, well, uh, you'll do. And so I led a uh, five-man team down to uh, Caracas and uh, in about uh, oh, three or four months we had negotiated the 1952 labor agreement which at that time was uh, responsible for about 400 million dollars of trade each way but which uh, within 10 years had grown to be four billion dollars of trade each way. So uh, getting those three uh, negotiations on my uh, file uh, was uh, helpful. Uh, I was in the lowest rank of the Foreign Service because I was an outsider who had come in yeah. and nobody was giving uh, this uh, outsider very good grades. I was competing with all the experienced people. But when I got to the State Department and began to do these things that I just described, mm -hmm. well, I uh, got a little bit of attention and two years later I finally got my first promotion. Uh, wow. and. Uh, then I went on up the ladder pretty fast. Uh, I had a wonderful tour of duty in Spain and uh, became director of the economic mission in Spain. And then another person who was influential in my life, Henry Holland, 
a very bright Houston attorney from Texas whom I knew and who knew, had known me because he was interested in Mexico and I was director of Mexican affairs and we got acquainted during that time in Washington principally. Uh, he, uh, when I was uh, coasting along in Spain and I found out later they were about to transfer me to Korea to make me the director of the economic mission in Korea, which would have been by far the biggest job uh, you could have in that field. Uh, Holland called me one day and he said, uh, uh, I want you to come back here and be my deputy, uh, deputy assistant secretary for inter-American affairs. Well, back in Washington with that? In Washington, back, back to Washington. Mm -hmm. I've been in Spain three years, yeah. a little over. Well, that was a very attractive offer. And uh, knowing Holland and so on, I, uh, I went to the ambassador and I said, I think I'm going to take this, and he encouraged me to do so. So I went back to Washington. In May or June of uh, 56, well, what I didn't know was that Holland was planning to resign. <laughs> and he resigned about uh, three months later. And by that time, of course, uh, I, I started going then to Secretary Dulles' staff meeting all the time, uh, which you do. We had the meeting in our bureau at 8.15, and he had his meeting at 9 o'clock every morning. And I had not known uh, Secretary Dulles before. Well, I started going to these meetings. And uh, one thing led to another. And finally, uh, in, uh, I guess, April of 57, and by that time, I'd been acting assistant secretary for six months. One day, we were driving over to Blair House to interview the Costa Rican president. He said, uh, Rubottom? Uh, yes, sir. He said, I'm sending your name in to the president today, recommending you to be assistant secretary. And I said, well, thank you very much for that vote of confidence. I said, uh, there are two or three leading political figures here who are angling for that same job. Well, do you want the job or not, he asked me. I said, yes, sir, I'll take it uh, if the president will appoint yeah. me. So I became assistant secretary of state wow. uh, there in uh, Wayne Morris, incidentally, was chairman of the Latin American Relations Subcommittee. And he held up my appointment for a couple of three months. And finally, the secretary had to call over and say, we want Rubottom on the job so he can head our delegation to this big trade conference in Argentina coming up in July or August. So they finally uh, had a hearing, and I went over. And they kept me there all day long. Uh, and uh, Wayne Morris was asking every conceivable kind of question. Uh, Senator Warren, he's from Oregon. And uh, I kept wondering why, what he was probing at. And so finally, at the end of the day, about 5.30 in the afternoon, he said, well, Rubottom, you have finally convinced me that even though you're from Texas, you don't have any interest in the oil industry. And therefore, I'm going to vote for your confirmation. His whole interest that day was trying to find out through all this probing, whether I owned any oil stock or whether I had any aunts or uncles or <laughs> grandparents who were oil people, so-called. And he, when he finally realized that I was just another uh, youngster who had come from nowhere in Brownwood and didn't own a lot, let alone an oil well, well, he was willing to uh, vote for my confirmation. So you were clean then. And I, uh, I was clean, and I became Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. Well, Obviously, uh, this was a big, big job. Mm -hmm. And it uh, provided me with great, great opportunities. Uh, I, as I wrote in one of my books, I've written a book and a couple of papers. Uh, I didn't write any books when I became a senior, or didn't have any negotiating experience, rather, when I became a senior officer. I had had that experience when I was more junior. Yeah. and. Uh, that was, that's an interesting phenomenon, yeah, right. at least in my case it was a phenomenon. But President Eisenhower had a wonderful brother named Dr. Milton Eisenhower, yes. and he was very, very interested in Latin America, and had made two big tours around and had written two books. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he became a friend of mine, and obviously a supporter of mine. And uh, my wife and I made uh, two trips with him to Latin America. And I used to cherish the times. He was president of Johns Hopkins University. Yes, I remember that. And he would uh, call me over 
and invite me to dinner in Baltimore. And I'd drive over there and we'd sit and talk, and, uh, have a cocktail before dinner. He, uh, his wife was gone and his daughter by that time I think was uh, uh, about to get married, so he was alone. So that was a wonderful, wonderful friendship. And I'm, of course, I'm, um, I'll have to acknowledge it probably didn't hurt my career any either. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, think so. To have him as a friend. Yeah. And uh, for out of that uh, job, after almost four years, uh, I was sent as ambassador to Argentina. And that uh, lasted about a year and a half, not quite two years. And I came home and went to the Naval War College. Uh, they moved ambassadors around pretty fast at that time, and uh, LBJ, of course, had succeeded to the presidency. Incidentally, my appointment as ambassador to Argentina, people frequently say, well, who appointed you? I said, well, both Eisenhower and Kennedy. Oh, really? How'd that happen? I said, well, I was appointed in the last three months of Eisenhower's administration, and when Kennedy succeeded to the presidency, I was one of the first three ambassadors. All of us were career people mm. whom he confirmed and kept on the job. Mm. So I got two, got two appointments out of that. But anyway, I came back uh, home after <clears throat> about a year and a half and went up to Naval War College. And by that time, LBJ was president. And I had uh, inadvertently, totally innocently alienated him when I was assistant secretary. And he, uh, apparently they put my name in for about three ambassadorships and he simply wouldn't move on it. Hmm. And finally, uh, uh, Dean Rusk was then Secretary of State. And he called me over one day and talk, talked to me about it. And I said, well, I think I'm gonna resign. I said, I've been offered uh, one, uh, one deanship at George Washington University. And I've been uh, offered uh, a job with the Ford Foundation and I think I'll take one of those jobs. Well, I went back up to Newport and uh, had a phone call from Willis Tate. He said, uh, you've given my name as reference to a couple of people. Are you getting ready to leave the Foreign Service? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, can you meet me in New York next week? I said, yes. So I met him at the airport and he offered me the vice presidency of SMU I accepted, we came back to Dallas, and we started to work, you and I as his vice president. Right. So that's, that's. And that was in 1965 or six? 64. Uh, 64, 64, and then I came in in 66. That's and, right, mm -hmm. that's right, yeah. so, th so much for that. Well, what a distinguished career, my, and uh, we're, we're all uh, f flattered and honored to <laughs> <laughs> have you uh, participating here today. Uh, you came into the administration then in the mid-60s just in time as I did to uh, inherit a lot of the uh, fall de roll that was happening in the 60s. Uh, do you have any fond recollections of that particular period when we faced a good deal of campus unrest? Well, we, uh, they were challenging times and uh, uh, I think even before we had uh, the incident where Willis moved out of his office for a little while and left me in there with <laughs> Joe Howell. Uh, we had the Martin Luther King uh, visit right, to right. Uh, the campus in 1968. And there was a great deal of concern about whether we could have that event uh, and not have violence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, about that time, I had uh, been responsible for hiring uh, Bill Caffey as director yes. of our security. That was a good move. And he was a man in whom I had a lot of confidence and he'd, he'd been in the Marines, he'd been decorated uh, in combat and promoted to a, a lieutenancy in Korea and he'd been down at A&M and I got him, I happened to meet him, heard about him, brought him up here, made him director of security. So we uh, worked uh, liaison with the sheriff's office, the police, both the University Park Police and the Dallas Police, and uh, set up what we thought would be adequate security. And I remember C.A. Tatum, I think, was chairman of the board at the time, and he and others, uh, not the, including Willis, were they were <laughs> they, they were really on the little tenor hooks, little yeah. Little yeah. But, yeah. but uh, it went off without any problem. The 
1969, I believe it was, it could have been a little later, May of 70, I believe it was later. 69 was when the trouble broke out in Berkeley, I believe, yeah, and, and spread time, to yeah. Columbia and Wisconsin where they had a death and so on. I think by the, by the time uh, the uh, motivated people to do something on the campus, the students, got the courage up to do it, it was sometime in early 1970. And uh, they uh, paraded out in front of uh, the administration building. And uh, then they, uh, they came in and um, Willis uh, was in his office. He talked to him for a while. There was one black student in the group, our all-American football player at the right. time, uh, who, and they were apparently quite moderate and well-behaved. And Willis excused himself and invited Joe Howell, who was just outside, the right. dean of student life, uh, to come into his office. And I was, my office was right next door. And uh, I, I give Joe a lot of credit. He, uh, he was uh, excellent at working with students mm -hmm. under those circumstances. He was, yes. And uh, was really more involved in dealing with them on that occasion than I was. Uh, I remember Sidney Reagan was chairman of the faculty senate. Uh, Sidney and Barbara Reagan had been friends of ours from our days down at UT when they were both oh, really? uh, long. graduate students, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Billy and I hadn't even uh, yet married at the time, and they were close friends. Anyway, Sidney walked into my office, and he was, uh, he was just literally almost sick uh, with concern about what might happen. And uh, I gave him all the reassurance that I could, and uh, we got Joe Howell out to talk to him. And I think we uh, eventually convinced him that we were going to be able to handle this without, uh, without any violence, and we did, fortunately. Mm -hmm. And later in the afternoon, <coughs> I went down to uh, see Willis, who was with some of the board members down at the gym, to uh, explain what had happened and how things had developed, and naturally they were all relieved. Uh, but that was really uh, about the only thing that we had on this campus yes. at that time. Yeah. Fortunately, we had some time to get prepared for those yeah, things. Yeah, we did. Because we did. They, it, it, it had arrived. broken out earlier, so we, yeah. weren't, we weren't unprepared. And it would arrive here about six weeks after it that's, was, that's was right. gone in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I had an interesting uh, experience along that line myself. Uh, but the day before this so-called sit-in, we had long, day-long conversations with the students. Looked like everything was well in hand. I was supposed to go to New Orleans the next day to represent the university at an academic uh, conference. And I asked Willis, you think I ought to, I ought to go ahead? He said, yeah, everything is in control, go ahead. I took my wife and we went to New Orleans the following day, checked into a hotel, turned on the TV, and the first thing we heard was that the president's office had been occupied. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you didn't get on the plane and come back, as I recall. I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, we could have used you, but I don't think uh, your absence uh, made the difference. I, uh, I, those well, things were well handled. They were going to happen. They were going to happen. They were going to happen. We had student, uh, both leaders and uh, followers, who uh, just couldn't stay out of this. There was mm -hmm. just too much happening all over the country. And uh, the student role uh, was important, and they they acted responsibly ultimately. Yes, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Well, your uh, association with Latin America, though, certainly did not terminate with your resignation from the Foreign Service. Uh, no. Uh, after you left uh, SMU, you went as president uh, to a university in Mexico. Yes, I. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I guess I was, uh, it was in 1971, yeah. and uh, Willis had announced his, uh, Willis Tate had announced his uh, retirement or resignation as president, and I knew that with a new president coming in that uh, he would probably want his own vice presidents, and uh, I had sort of a non-portfolio job at that time anyway because I was still recovering from a terrible automobile accident which right. had occurred yes. in 1969. And uh, Dr. Tate and the board and others had been, and you too, because you, your work was heavier, were good enough to 
uh, keep me on and to welcome me back, even though I'd been out in the hospital about oh, six or seven months. But anyway, uh, uh, the uh, former, one of the former presidents of TCU, Harold Lindley, had gone down to the University of the Americas in uh, Mexico City and taken over the presidency of what had been a small college. And uh, with a grant from the government and a grant from a Mexican uh, foundation, they built a beautiful new campus over in Puebla, which is 80 miles east of Mexico City. Lindley went over there for one year, and he decided uh, he wanted to resign. That work was finished. And, and so he came up here, and he invited me down there to look over the place. And eventually, he and the board offered me the presidency. And with Willis's departure, it seemed very timely. Mm -hmm. So I went down there in 1971, and I stayed two years. Uh, it was a beautiful place to work, and uh, we had a, an in incredible residence uh, in Cholula, a little town right next door to Puebla, the large city there. But uh, after two years, uh, I decided on my own, without anybody telling me, uh, that uh, the president of the University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico, probably should be a Mexican, Mexican. Mm -hmm. and not an American. And so I resigned and came back to yeah. Dallas. And um, I talked to Dr. Brooks, who at that time, I guess, had just taken over as provost. And he said that uh, they could uh, uh, make me a scholar in residence or something like that. Mm -hmm. The political science department was, uh, shall I say, uh, willing to uh, uh, let me come in and teach a course in Latin American relations because I did have fairly significant credentials and experience in that field. I would think so, And yes. so uh, uh, that was very interesting because uh, later on, I, I, from personal experience, I found that uh, a retired diplomat who has had significant experience can come into a department like that and be respected mm -hmm. and uh, given an opportunity. He's not working on tenure. He's not competing with anybody. Right. And so, whereas uh, if you come in from the outside from most other fields, I think you meet a little bit more resistance. But I was given a very cordial welcome in that department. And I stayed on uh, uh, and uh, from about 10 years. I'd, from 73 to 83, I think, yeah. and taught U.S.-Mexico relations, uh, Latin American relations, and uh, maybe one other course. Uh, oh, eventually I, I volunteered to teach American government. <laughs> Actually, that was one reason why the department was willing to take me back. Uh -huh. uh, I enjoyed teaching American government because uh, it's an eye-opening course and you have students who are freshmen, sophomores, maybe a few juniors, and it, uh, I had classes of around 50. Mm. And I met at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then uh, we usually stayed awake uh, <laughs> for the next hour and a half. Including the teacher, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was, a, that was a, another wonderful uh, add-on, so to speak, to my uh, yeah. SMU experience. Well, a part of your internationalism has also been expressed through the Boy Scouts of America. And uh, what... Tell us a little bit about that role. You've been active in that for a long while. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> people frequently ask me uh, at my tender age, uh, well, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I always answer it this way. I volunteer in four different uh, uh, environments that are quite different and give me a, 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 an interesting assignment from time to time. What are they? Well, they're the Boy Scouts of America. The, the Rotary Club, uh, SMU, and the Highland Park United Methodist Church. Uh, I had been here one year when I was asked to serve in, as vice president. This was 1965. And uh, former Dean Joe Harris, now deceased, good friend of yours, oh, yes. Yes, very and another friend. person called on me and asked me if I would serve on the uh, executive board of Circle 10 Council of the Scouts. Well, I had been uh, a sort of a remote scouter through my two sons, 
My own scouting experience had been limited to one year when I was in Brownwood because I was working all the time as a kid. But I accepted that and I went on the, uh, on the board and uh, then lo and behold I found myself serving as vice president of the board under four successive board presidents, one of whom was Governor Clements. And uh, that was a great volunteer experience, and I uh, am still on that board, by the way. But uh, in 1972, uh, I was still involved at SMU. I guess I was uh, teaching. Uh, I had two callers who asked me if I would join the International Committee of the National Council of mm -hmm. the Scouts, mm -hmm. which was a different level. It was the, the National Council level. Yeah. And, of course, with my interest in Latin America and uh, so on, I agreed to that. And uh, almost immediately went down to Chile for a meeting of the Inter-American Scout Conference and was elected a representative of the Boy Scouts of America on that council, which mm. is a four-year job. And so I traveled around the area, went to the meetings every year, served on a couple of committees, and uh, became uh, more and more involved in international scouting. And uh, then uh, I was uh, eventually selected as a delegate to the World Scout Conference. And I went to five successive World Scout Conferences as one of the six delegates with a vote of the BSA. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were all over. They were Munich, uh, Paris, uh, Bangkok, uh, Oslo, and uh, one other that uh, eludes me right now, but uh, fascinating experiences. Wonderful, wonderful people to meet yeah. all over. And so uh, I am still on the International Committee of the National Council of the Scout Scouts. In fact, I'm going to the National Council meeting in Nashville uh, in uh, May uh, to uh, attend the meeting of that committee. Mm. And I, uh, I didn't attend the last uh, uh, World Scout Conference. Uh, it was held in Durban, South Africa. And I'd been to South Africa twice. And frankly, I didn't want to make that plane trip again. <laughs> so, uh, so I demurred on that. But uh, it's, scouting has been great. Uh, I was a member of the Rotary Club in Mexico way back when I was a naval officer. I was a member in Paraguay when I was a naval officer. Uh, I was a member in Bogota, Colombia when I was in the Foreign Service as a very junior officer. And then when I was ambassador in Argentina, I was a member of the Rotary Club. Mm -hmm. And the Rotary Club is a fantastic worldwide organization. It has chapters now in 180 countries. And it uh, recently completed a campaign in which he spent more than $250 million to eliminate polio, virtually eliminate it all around the yeah. world. Put, in, put the nail in the coffin of that dread disease. So uh, Rotary is, uh, has been a wonderful part of my life. I'm, uh, I've been president of the Dallas Rotary Club five years ago, uh, and I go to meetings every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And as luck would have it, every fifth year, a president rotates back on the board. So I'm oh. back on the board of the <laughs> Dallas Rotary Club for the remainder of this year until That's July. That's the downtown club. That's the downtown club. We have, uh, it's a large club, a wonderful club, and uh, still, meet at the uh, Union still Station. meets in Union mm -hmm. Station. And it's uh, getting ready to have its second uh, year of a wonderful, wonderful uh, charitable effort uh, when about uh, 200 members of Rotary get on a bus in the morning and go down to the schools in South Dallas and take these beautiful reading books. I like to read yeah. and sit there and read with the children and leave them with these books, which That's they wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise have. That's great. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great project. Uh, I didn't go last year, but I volunteered to go this year mm -hmm. to be a part of it. So uh, I find that that job uh, and that organization is still inspiring. Uh, I have done a lot of things in Highland Park United Methodist Church. It's, it's a great, great church. 
It's doing some big, big things right now, as you know, getting ready for a major building program. And uh, I, uh, I had an interesting experience one day. Leighton Farrell, who was then the minister, uh, called me and asked me to come down to see him. And I, he said, uh, Dick, I want uh, to ask you to serve as chairman of the administrative board next year. By that time, I'd been on the board, I guess, 15, 20 years. I said, Leighton, I'm 80 years old. You don't want me. He said, uh, forget about your age. Uh, we'd like to have you as chairman of the board. So I, I, I took that job. And believe it or not, <laughs> Billy are now, uh, Billy and my wife and I are now assistant coordinators in the big fundraising oh, really? coming up. <laughs> so so well, you, you can't let loose, you know. It's kind of like, it's kind of sticky, it's like Br'er Rabbit. Uh. And how old do you admit to being now, then? Well, I admit to being 88 uh, and uh, one month, last oh. February, uh, <laughs> last month, 13th of February. Uh, what a career you've had. And, uh, <laughs> What a blessing you've been to the university and to the larger world. Well, I've had uh, wonderful opportunities, and uh, as I told you right in the beginning, uh, I've had uh, transforming experiences, mostly, seems to me, as a result of uh, wonderful, wonderful people who have befriended me and placed their confidence in me. And I guess I'd have to start, uh, which I should have mentioned at the very beginning, with my mother. Uh, my mother and father separated when I was 12 years old, when I entered mm. high school. Yeah. So she was left alone, and she uh, ran a boarding house in Brownwood so that I didn't have to worry about her. All I had to do was take care of myself. So uh, she was a great influence on my life. Yeah. And uh, others whose name I've already, names I've already mentioned were great influences. And it's just been a wonderful, wonderful life, and I'm... Uh, I haven't given any credit at all to my wife, Billy, whom you know. I know her but, well. But uh, she, uh, she's, I could tell, speak a lot longer on her, but that may be for another time. Well, of course, my wife also was at one time your secretary. I'll not ask you to comment on that <laughs> relationship, but uh, uh, she values the, the experience of having worked with you and well, has a great uh, respect Connie, for you. Uh, Connie is a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, she came to help me at a somewhat parlous time in the office. Yes. Uh, and uh, it was a, a great, great time that we had together. And uh, I can remember when we came home from Mexico one time, and I believe she told Billy about uh, your plans to marry, and you couldn't have had two happier uh, <laughs> friends uh, to yes. hear that news than Billy and me. Well, do you have any observations to make concerning the, uh, the university now and where it's going? Uh, what are your impressions as to uh, how the university is going? Well, I uh, have been very impressed uh, with uh, the way the university is going. Uh, I think our, uh, our president is a, is a great leader, and uh, he uh, combines to an unusual degree I think the uh, qualities that ap appeal to a faculty and are necessary for a faculty to work and be mm -hmm. loyal to a president and at the same time appeal to a board and prospective donors uh, in terms of attracting yes. donations. And with that uh, uh, combination, I think Dr. Turner is, uh, has le led the university into a new level. Yes. Uh, and uh, it seems to me, academically, that we're attracting uh, uh, outstanding faculty people. We're getting the respect of uh, the local community. We still have a large number of outstanding students locally who come here who could go to Stanford or Harvard or anywhere else yes. but pick SMU. And one other thing that's very, very important, uh, and that is, uh, I think, the uh, effort to recruit and hold uh, minority students so that we have a diverse student body uh, is, is also evident on the campus. Mm -hmm. Not just on the athletic teams, uh, but uh, in, the faculty, in the student body at large. And incidentally, uh, I think SMU and under Dr. Turner's leadership and the athletic director uh, Copeland's leadership and the coaches has struck a, a balance uh, between uh, academic achievement and uh, athletic achievement 
that is uh, sometimes hard to find mm -hmm. in university leadership. And uh, while we don't uh, uh, march off down the field with as many football triumphs, uh, perhaps, as we used to, uh, we still are able to hold our heads up and uh, be respected as an opponent. And we're certainly doing well in a large number of other sports. I follow them pretty closely in the paper yeah. still. And uh, of course, uh, swimming, which was my son's prominent activity here. Uh, he was a better swimmer than he was a student, I think. But he swam for four years, was All-American four years. Is still a, a premier sport on the campus. Yeah, it so, really is, yes. So uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I think uh, that needs to be said because uh, that, too, is important in the university. And we're graduating a significant number of our that's athletes. Right. Yes, which, that's another factor. That's I don't the, know the details. but Well, I don't, I don't have those figures yeah. in mind, but it's, uh, it's, it's significant and uh, compared with many other universities. If, in is there time for me to bring up one other thing, uh, I, Neil? I, I think so. Uh, yes, uh, please do. This is something that I uh, think is uh, sensitive, but I think I'd like to say it nevertheless. Uh, going back to my mother and coming right on up uh, through Dean Zumbrunnen and Dean V.I. Moore, whose father was a Methodist minister, and then coming to SMU and being in the influence of this great institution with its leadership, uh, Willis Tate and others, uh, and being in the church at the same time, uh, the spiritual uh, influence in my life has been very significant. And it's been a great, great support. Uh, you, uh, it's one of those things that you don't, uh, you don't ask for specific things, obviously. Uh, but somehow, I think with that, uh, with that strength in a person, uh, it enables you to take advantage and to be uh, open to opportunities that you might not otherwise see. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, you'll make a step that will uh, honor and respect that particular phase of your life, your spiritual growth and development, and pass up something else that may be significant. Uh, when I was a student, Dean Zumbrunnen called me in I think it was in my junior year, just before Christmas, asked me what I was going to do during the holidays. I said, probably go down to Brownwood for a few days, come back up here and attend some of the Christmas parties and have a good time. He said, well, how would you like to go to Buffalo, New York? I said, what for? He said, well, the student volunteer movement is holding its uh, international convention up there. And there are a great uh, number of world leaders like John R. Mott, and others who are going to be there. And if you'd like to go, uh, I'd like to nominate you with, I think, two or three others for, from SMU to go, and uh, we'll pay your expenses. So I went. And uh, being down on your knees, you know, on New Year's Eve and a few other of uh, those experiences up there, uh, uh, maybe it wasn't significant at the time, but in the long mm -hmm. run, it added something to my life. Right. Uh, just like taking the two religion courses here. Uh, I had to take them then in those days. I don't think they have were required then. They yes. were required. And uh, I think uh, Dean Zumbrunnen actually taught my Old Testament course. Yes. And uh, there's quite a story in the New Testament. I took it in my senior year. I had to finish it. And about midway in the semester, this young woman teacher called me in one day and said, Mr. Rubottom, are you planning to graduate? And I said, yes. Yeah. She said, you better start coming to class. <laughs> so needless to say, I, I never missed another New Testament class at 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I did pass it, and I did graduate. But all of those things combined uh, with my mother's uh, very strong influence, who incidentally was a Christian scientist, and both my sisters were Christian scientists, uh, uh, Willis Tate, of course, uh, was also, I think, spiritually led, uh, uh, yes. very much so in his life. All those, those things were influences that I know were important and still are in my life, and I don't want to leave it out. Yes. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, this, after all, highlights the purpose of this university. Yeah, that's right. Well, our time is about up, and uh, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Rubottom for his presence here today and for the illuminating 
presentation that he has made. And we thank all of you for um, watching this um, videotape and hope that it will be helpful to you in understanding more fully <laughs> the history of SMU. Thank you very much. Thank you.